that really Christianity can't be successful without trusting in God. Because it's a path that is foreign to us. Uh, the, it, the way of living is so different from the way that, that we're used to living that a lot of times we're not going to be sure, and that, that's going to be our challenge, and we're going to look at this a little bit more, but a lot of times we're not sure, uh, should we go down this path? Uh, is this the right path? How this is going to turn out? But we have to keep our minds and our thoughts on what God has said, the promises that he has made, but also the understanding that God is not going to lead us wrong. He's never going to lead us wrong. So if we have that knowledge, then it will take us a long, long way. Now, what I'm going to be emphasizing in this uh, once again, and I want to show it to you once again here in uh, Hebrews, the 10th chapter, as we go on, and uh, as I want to remind us what we were already looked at. But if you come down to verse 38, and we looked at the passage from Hebrews 10, 32 through 39, but let me say this sort of point us back why, uh, why this is so important. Because we know that faith is very common in uh, uh, Christianity, our walk with Christ. But I want you to look at God's side of it. We saw to see our side of it. But in verse 38, it says, But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. In other words, there's no pleasing God without faith. It's not. And it it's just like, I think, in a lot of ways with us as well. You realize how difficult it is to relate to someone who doesn't trust you? That's hard. And it's the same way, or even more so, with the God in which we serve. I mean, here he's trying to deal with people or individual, but the person is showing constantly they don't really trust him. So there's no pleasing God without faith. And we know in the, in the 11th chapter, it, make, it brings that statement uh, pretty clear as well. So here's the things that we've looked at so far. We acknowledge the fact that we're not talking about not having any faith. What, what we're looking at in Jesus' words is having little faith. Because we all have a certain degree of faith. But let us not be satisfied with what we have. Let us always be striving to grow and to build uh, and to strengthen what we have. Because so many of God's people say, well, I got that little mustard seed of faith, right? So that should be good enough. A matter of fact, Jesus said, I can move mountains with that. Well, a seed grows. A seed doesn't accomplish very much in staying a seed. It's the potential that is in that seed. That, that it would grow. We looked at the challenges of faith also. And we look more so at the situation with uh, Peter. And Jesus walking on the water. Peter asked the Lord that he would walk on the water as the Lord was doing. The Lord told him, come on. And Peter did. He got out of the boat and still considered that question. You need to answer that question for yourself. Would you have gotten out of the boat? That's the greatest challenge I have to ask myself. And these amazing things of God. Would I have gotten out of the boat? Because Peter got out of the boat. And amazingly, he walked on the water for a short period of time. But when he failed, and we're going to look at why he fell. But when he fell, or let me put it this way, when his faith failed, Jesus made the statement, O oh, ye of little faith. So we're, we're, we're not seeking to look at faith through my eyes, your eyes, our eyes. But we want to try to evaluate our faith through the eyes of Jesus. Does he see that we have little faith? Small amount of faith? Or as we saw in the other two examples, will Jesus marvel over our faith? Because we also looked at the example found in Luke chapter 7, verses 2 through 10 where the centurion there asked Jesus to come and to heal his slave. And then the centurion also sent word to Jesus that you don't even have to come, just say the word, speak the word, because this man understood authority. And Jesus marveled at this man's faith. Jesus, the creator of everything, marveled at a human being's faith. That challenges me. 
We also considered the Canaanite woman found in Matthew chapter 15. And uh, there, uh, this Canaanite woman came to Jesus and Jesus wanted her to understand, well, his ministry basically was to uh, the, the house of Israel. So her being a Canaanite, she was in a sense excluded at that particular time. But this woman would not give up. Even in a sense when Jesus insulted her, she would not give up. She came and she uh, prostrated herself before him, asking him to kill, uh, to uh, heal her daughter. And once again, Jesus marveled at this woman's faith. So the Lord can be impressed, if you allow me to use that word, by our faith. But he's not impressed by little faith. It's when that faith began to grow and to blossom and to turn into that, that tree as the mustard seed. We reminded ourselves what faith is. Faith is the conviction of things that we hope for. The assurance of the things that we hope for. The conviction of things not seen. So we reminded ourselves that we have to challenge ourselves when it comes to the physical things. Not just be satisfied with the things that we see, the things that we can feel, the things that we can sense, because there's so much more outside of us and is available to us. So it is when we uh, proceed or do, when we don't know how things are going to turn out, when we don't know how, what the results are going to be, we don't know how long it's going to take. Time is, is a great challenge as well, because we want it now. We want it now. We looked at also, and this is where we're going to pick up once again, the causes and the growth of faith. And we looked at Romans chapter 10, where the statement was, 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 uh, was made there that faith comes by hearing, comes by hearing. And I'm noticing that a lot of people are slacking a lot on presenting themselves before the word of God and being willing to listen to the things of God and to be challenged by the God of heaven. They don't think it's any port, uh, important anymore. They allow all kinds of things to come in and to interfere and to keep them away. And they don't realize that they are cheating themselves out of the source that will cause their faith to grow. That will cause their faith to grow because it is the word of God. Now, I realize that we can read it our own, on our own. But once again, other people's thoughts upon it, other people's uh, workings with it, other people's challenging uh, with it, that adds to it as well. Because we get that wider and variety of thought concerning it. So we want to pick up here. And let's, so let's go to James chapter 1. As we consider the growth of, of the source and the, uh, the causes and the growth of faith. So it comes from God's word. But there is another source. Have you ever wondered why God's people, Christian people, have problems, have challenges? Have trials? Have you ever wondered? Because in a lot of people's mind, a Christian should have an easy life. And by the way, that's not true. <laughs> I wish it was true, but that's not true. And we're told, let's just read this passage in James. And it may shock you in, in uh, verse 2 as we start. As he starts out, it says, consider it woefully joyful and I'm reading this out of Amplified Translation woefully joyful my brethren whenever you are enveloped in or encounter trials of any sort or fall into various temptations so the, ampli the Amplified covers the whole gamut of the things that we come in uh, that we face in life whether it's temptations have you ever wondered why is that temptation there there's a purpose whether it's uh, trials, difficulties, whether there's challenges. Because if you're like me, I, I just 
desire our life to be a smooth road. No bumps. No obstacles. He goes on in verse 3. He says, be assured and understanding that the trial and proving of your faith brings out endurance and steadfastness and patience. Amplified translation. Once again, covering the whole gamut of what we're dealing with. Here's, here's what James is saying in short order. The reason that we face challenges in life, and please understand, this comes from God. If it's from Satan, God is allowing it. So God is over all of this when it comes to the trials. But remember this. When we encounter trials, um, challenges in life, difficulties in life, facing temptation, God sees a need for our faith to grow. That's why he allows it. Now, if I'm dealing with these things and I'm failing, that is revealing to me my need for my faith to grow. When I'm facing temptation and once again, if I'm failing, that shows my need for my faith to grow. And God is going to allow those things to come. He has a, but he always has a purpose. He is not trying to defeat, defeat us. Satan may have the thought of defeating us and causing us to stumble in trouble. But the Lord is seeking to prove us. To prove us. Have you have ever had confidence in the area of life and you thought that, hey, I'm doing pretty good. I've got this down, right? And then something comes along and just trips you up. I think we all have. We all have. See, once again, that's showing to us there are some things that I need to work on in areas that I need to get into God's word, maybe get a better understanding, maybe praying for God's health and strength and insight. But I need to work on this so that I can uh, make it stronger. Look at verse four. Now the proving our faith brings about endurance. What is endurance? Perseverance. perseverance. Break it down a little bit more. What is perseverance? To persevere. Give up. Never give up. What was it? Yeah. yeah. It is that thought. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to take a detour. I'm not going to allow it to stop me. I'm going to keep going. And here's the best thing that we can do. And we all, once again, we all experience, we all experience failure somewhere along the line. You remember that old saying? Pick yourself up, dust yourself off, get on that horse again, keep riding. That's the best we can all do. Never quit. Never get the attitude, I can't do this, or it's never going to get better. Keep riding. And you're going to find yourself that you're enduring and you're going to come to the end of this race. Maybe still trying, but you're coming to the end of the race. He says in verse 4, but he says, but let endurance and steadfastness and patience have full play to do a thorough work so that you may be a people. Look at this last part. So that you may be a people perfectly and fully developed with no defects, lacking in nothing. That's the result of endurance because if I quit... I'm going to remain there whatever level I may be, but you probably won't even remain there. You're going to begin to go backwards. If I ever quit and if I ever give up. But if I keep going, it may be pro, uh, slow progress and it may, I may just be inching along, but I'm making progress. And I am maturing in the faith. That is what God is looking for. That we will uh, mature in the faith. Now, we have to look at this last part as well. Because there is something that will defeat our faith. 
Now, we're not saying we don't have any faith. Each one of us have a certain level of faith. But there is something that will defeat our faith. And it's very common. It's very common. Let's go back to the example of Peter. Jesus Christ coming walking on the water. Peter had this desire to walk on the water as the Lord did. Peter was the only one that got out of the boat. That was this his display of faith. And in my thinking, that was great. That was awesome. That was way up there in walking on the water. But if you look at that account, the scripture tells us as he was walking on the water, he began to look around. And he saw the wind. Now, we can't see the wind. But we can see the result of the wind, right? So what did he see? The waves. The waves. This was a storm. And when he saw the wind, he began to sink. And Jesus called that doubt. So we have a picture of amazing faith. Peter here in this example. But we see this thing of doubt coming in. And it defeated the faith that Peter had because he began to sink. He was walking on the water. He doubted because of the wind and the waves. And he began to sink. And he had to call out to the Lord Lord, help me. I think there's a lot of desperation in that, in that plea, in that call. Now, here is something that will defeat faith. When we focus more on what's happening around us. Because when Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the water, that wind was still there. The waves were still there. The storm was still going on. But apparently he uh, ignored it. Or let me put it this way. His focus was more on Christ than the storm when he walked on the water. But then his focus shift. It shifted away from Christ and he focused on the storm. And it caused him to doubt this is where a lot of God's people are. Their focus isn't on Christ. This is why they struggle so much. Their focus is on everything that is going on around them. And they may see a defeat over here. And they may see a defeat over here. And they may see difficult situations over here. And that's where their focus is. And whenever we lose focus from Christ. It is going to defeat our faith. We're going to begin to give all kinds of reasons why we can't do things. We're going to give all kinds of reasons why things can't be done. Our focus is wrong. Because there are we live in troubled times. I think we all know that, right? Well, we're living in crazy times. But where is our focus? One of my biggest challenges when it comes to faith as I look around and I look at all the different churches and I ask the Lord, Lord how? How? Are we going to give people's attention? Because they have this church over here and this church over here and this church over here and this church over here may be doing something that they like and they enjoy. And this church over here may be doing something that they like and they enjoy. How will we ever give people's attention to focus on your truth. Not on what everybody else is doing, but more on you, what you say, what you are speaking, what you're speaking. And the only thing that I can come up with, it has to happen by the Spirit of God. It has to. That's what we see in the book of Acts, right? It was the Spirit and the power of God. Now, we have a part we have a part, and the Lord wants to use us. But unless people come 
or become in tune with the Spirit of God, there's no chance. There's no chance. Because they have too many choices. Too many choices are there. I mean, I don't like a lot of choices. I go to the grocery store and they got, I don't know, five or ten different choices. Why do they have so many choices? Just give me two or three. Three at the most. That way it's easy. But when they have all these different things out there, we'll have to look at this and see if this is healthy and see that if that is uh, healthy or how healthy or, or better for me and all those different things. It just caused a lot of fluctuation. So we want to look at this thing of doubt. What is doubt? We have to define it. We have to define it according to how the scriptures define it. What is doubt? It's uh, not believing that somebody will keep their word or uh, like you put a story with you here. It's like Jesus had already um, proven that he could do it. And yeah. He still doubted. Yeah. Yeah. Doubt. Yeah. is defined from the Greek language as uncertainty. So once again, it's not really not believing. It's just that I'm not sure about this. And my uncertainty causes me to stop or to stall in doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Because I'm, I am unsure. The, the simple definition is uncertainty about the truth and the reality of spiritual things. That can be the reality of God's power. That can be the reality of God's uh, uh, existence. It can be the, the reality that God really cares about me and that he's, he's watching over me and that he's keeping me. I mean, it can go in every area. I'm just not sure. That's doubt. So we're not, once again, I'm stressing this, that it's not that saying that we don't have faith. But it is this struggle. And it is this battle of doubt that comes in and affects our faith. Look, Matthew chapter 14. Well, let, we've already, I've already mentioned that. Well, that. That's Peter. Let's go to Matthew chapter 26. Let me show you this thing of doubt as it works. Now, we looked at Peter. He walked on the water. He was walking on the water. But then doubt came in and counseled that out where he began to sink. Let's look at doubt in play once again. Matthew chapter 26. Here we're looking at the 11 apostles. And we know these men, uh, minus Judas, at this particular time. And we know that these men, they had a relationship with Christ. Uh, they had been taught by Christ for three, three and a half years. They were close to Jesus Christ. They had, even at this point, they had seen Jesus uh, alive after he had died. How can someone like that, we would question, battle doubt? Look at this particular instance, 28 chapter, verse 16. It says, but the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. And you can look at the context that has been used there. Verse 17, it says, when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some were. In uh, verse 17, 28. Matthew 28. Oh, 28. I yes. Yes. Oh, Isn't that amazing? They have seen, the, they are looking upon the resurrected Christ. They knew that he was dead. They actually worshiped him. And my understanding is that all of them worshiped him. They were, they were bowing down, but still there was doubt lurking. Is this really him? Is this real? So this thing with doubt is real. 
And we have to be aware of it. Because it's going to be a constant battle for us, but we have to overcome it. We have to overcome it. We cannot allow it to counsel out our faith, to alter our faith, and cause us not to be people of faith. Doubt. Uncertainty. Let me show it to you once once again. Mark. The Gospel of Mark. And this was mentioned last night or last week at the end of a class. This was the father who brought his son to Jesus' disciples, seeking to, that his son would be, would be healed. So as we look at this account, I want you to see how bad this father's situation was. Have you ever been around anyone? We call them seizures today who have had seizures. That's pretty scary. It's pretty scary. But notice what this father was dealing with. Let's start there in verse 17. Mark chapter 9 and verse 17. It says, And one of the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son possessed with a spirit which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it, notice the word, it slams him to the ground. And he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and stiffens out. Now, that's a pretty ser serious, if we want to call it a seizure or convulsion, that's pretty serious. I told your disciples to cast it out. And they could not do it. And he answered them and said, and notice Jesus' frustration. Jesus can get frustrated with us. He says, oh, unbelieving generation. This is Jesus speaking. How long shall I be with you? He's a little bit exasperated. How long shall I put up with you? Jesus speaking. So he says, bring him to me. They brought the boy to him. When he saw him, meaning the boy with the, with the uh, spirit or the demon, immediately the spirit threw him into a convulsion. This is right before Christ now. And falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. And he, Jesus, asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. Can you see this father's situation? Father's still speaking. It says, it has often uh, thrown him into uh, both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, here's the Lord's challenge. If you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Notice the father's statement. Immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Now, wait a minute. Is that a... An impossible, impossible situation, having faith but having unbelief at the same time? I don't think so. I don't think so. Because we all have faced the challenge. Something is whispering within the back of our mind and trying to come to the forefront as we seek to work or live out the things of God. Trying to put doubt. Trying to tell them it's not true. Trying to tell us it's not right. So this father, in his desperate situation with his son, because his son's life was on the line here. Apparently, for what he said, he had come close to death before. Been thrown in the water, been thrown in the fire. As he was pleading for help. Could his son be helped? He had enough faith to bring him to Jesus' disciples. He had enough faith to bring him to Jesus. 
but he was struggling as well. He recognized his unbelief. And he was even asking help for his unbelief. We need to ask for spiritual help when it comes to our doubting, our struggle with our unbelief, our weakness of faith when it shows itself. Because we can't do this on our own. We need the power and the strength and the ability of our God and Savior. The last things I want to look at as we look at this topic I want to show us the danger of it. Please don't take this lightly. Because having a little faith, having or allowing doubt to overcome the faith that we have, it is a very dangerous place to be. We've already seen that it's not pleasing to God if we shrink back. But notice a couple of other things. That the scripture brings out as well. Let's go to Romans chapter 14. And this was a church situation here. That the Romans were dealing with. And the Romans were facing. You know in a lot of people's mind. It was a very. Small insignificant issue. But apparently it wasn't. Because it had uh, spiritual uh, ramification. And it was. The things that they ate. And the situation was uh, those who were at one time not Christians, now they are Christians. And when they were not Christians, they were pagans. They were involved in uh, idolatry. And with idolatry, they ate various things or sacrificed various things to their idols. So when they became a Christian, this thing of eating certain types of meat, especially meat that was sacrificed to idols, it became a very conscious issue. Conscious issue. So we have to be aware of that with our fellow brethren as well. The conscious issues. Maybe it was the things that they were involved in before. And now even when they are a Christian, they sort of struggling with it because it reminds them or take their minds back to where they were before. We have to be aware of those. Here's where this Roman church was with this issue of eating certain foods or meats that were sacrificed to idols. Now, if you know the whole issue, because Paul dealt with it in in, in different congregations, he made the point there's nothing wrong with the meat. It's a conscience issue. But here's what he says as he was working with it here with the Romans. Verse 22, Romans 14, 22. I'm just sort of uh, coming to the end of it. You can uh, read the complete uh, 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 working with it uh, later on. He says, the faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. And let's keep it in context. Because some Christians could eat the meat. They had no conscious problems at all. There were other Christians who were struggling in eating the meat and it bothered their conscience. How do you deal with a situation like that? Paul says, the conviction that you have, you personally have it before God. And then he goes on, happy is he who does not uh, condemn himself in what he approves. But, here's our topic once again, he who doubts, remember it means uncertain, you're not sure if this is right or wrong concerning your conscience, He says, but he who doubts, look how how serious this is, is condemned if he eats. Notice the word condemn. That's a strong word. That's a strong language. God never desires for anyone to devour, defile, distort, their conscience. Because that's your guide. If you mess your conscience up, you're not going to know which way is up. So he says, follow your conscience. 
And if you have any doubt in this context of eating, and this can be any, any topic at all, he says you condemn if you do it and your conscience is telling you not to do it. He goes on. He explains. He says because his eating is not from faith and whatever, now he's opening it up to anything, not just simply eating of, of meat, but he says whatever is not from faith is sin. So we can't go against our conscience. So we always have to be at the point in the things that we do, we're talking about how we're living here with the eating of meat and the other things, that we have trust in God, that God has allowed this, this will be pleasing to God, and I'm putting my trust in Christ, in this action that I'm doing. You know, one of the things that I'm learning, and I, I usually ask this question uh, when uh, people have questions or they're doubting about certain things, I pose the question, what does the Lord want you to do? You realize that's something they never considered? That's something they've never considered. That should be the first thing that I give consideration to. Is this something that the Lord wants me to do? Or, uh, sort of, given a variation on the question, is the Lord guiding and directing you in this? Is this according to the Lord's will for you? And once again, they throw up their hands and say, I don't know. If I don't know, I shouldn't be doing it. I shouldn't be doing it. If I don't know whether or not it's according to the Lord's will. If I don't know, I should be getting into God's word a little bit more so that I can get an understanding of what the Lord's desire is in situations, whatever situations that I'm in. If I'm just sort of throwing up my hand, I don't know if this is God's will or not, and I go ahead and do it, I'm sinning. This is what we just read. And it says, I'm condemned. Because what I'm doing is not of faith. Not my words. It's not my words. Because the Lord is looking for his people to trust him. Always looking towards him for guidance, direction, approval in the things that we do. And if the Lord is not giving us that approval, and hopefully we're looking for it. We need to look for it first. Seek it. But if the Lord doesn't give us that approval. We need to stop. Give thought. Seek God's will. And seek that approval. Otherwise we're looking at condemnation. Because it's not a faith. This is how important this is. Let me show you another one as we close this out. The first chapter of James. First chapter of James. We're looking at this thing, the dangers of doubt. Starting there in the, in the fifth verse. James says, if any of you lack wisdom, and once again, the context is, is trials, difficult situations of life. He says, but if any of you like wisdom, let him ask of God. See, we, have, we need to be, be in constant contact with our Lord and Savior. So we should be asking him concerning things, not just simply things that we need, but we should be asking him for guidance and direction and what his will is in various situations. We need to be talking to him. He goes on. He says, who gives to all generously... And without reproach, in other words, God is not going to look down upon you because you're asking. God is not going to belittle you because you don't understand. He wants us to seek. So he, he, will, so he will give all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Verse 6. But he must ask in faith without any doubting. 
See, even our asking, we have to push back on doubt. We have to fight against doubt. Even in our asking. He says, he explains, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea. Now, once again, I mentioned water last, uh, last week. I don't like water because it's not stable. It's not stable. Large, large bodies of water. But look at this picture that the scriptures is giving us. A person who doubts when it comes in our asking with God, because that's where all things uh, begin. It's just like water. I mean, you're up, you're down. A little wind comes along and it blows the wave and blows the water over here. It blows the water over there. It blows the water over there. And the water or the surf, it changes with the direction of the wind. So there's no stability there at all. What's the cause? Doubt. Doubt. When you find people who are stable, where things of life comes along and they can't move them, they don't budge, they weather the storm, so to speak, no matter how difficult it may be, you're looking at a person or you're looking at people who has faith because they're showing it. But when difficulties of life or challenges of life comes along and it blows people away and it blows a lot of people away, I'm amazed how situations of life, how it affect people. Christians are supposed to be. Change their views, change their faith, change their thinking, change their loyalty, change all those different things. Because some situation has come along and just sort of blown them away. They're unstable. And doubt has overcome them. So they are like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Look at verse 7, though. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. Now remember, he says those who are asking, supposed to ask in faith without doubting. Now, if I ask with doubting, I should have no expectation that God is going to give me anything. That's what we just read. You see how this thing of doubt just sort of counsels out faith? And you realize that uh, uh, as, as we're looking at it too, it affects what the Lord does for us. And it's amazing that those who doubt, they really have a high expectation of what the Lord will do. But I also have found that they are the first ones who accuses God of all kinds of accusations. They are the first ones. They are usually the complainers too. They're, they are the ones who rebel as well. I've noticed that. It, it just stands out there. And you can't miss it. Because they are unstable. And they are like the surface of the sea. But the underlying problem is small faith. A faith that doubt has come in and just simply affecting, apparently, in great ways. That person or people like this should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Look at verse 8. Here's how the Lord sees people like this. Being a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. What does it mean to be double-minded? It's involved in consistency. Say one thing and do another. Yeah. It carries the meaning of basically of being having two minds. You know, I, yeah, I believe this. Yeah. But also, I believe this as well, but it's opposite than what I said I believe over here. Or it doesn't equate double minded. So that this, these people will go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Because 
there's no stability that is there. They're, they're fighting between these two ways of thinking, so to speak. These, these two ways of seeing things. And they can't decide upon one. The Lord sees them as being double-minded. And the Lord sees their lack of stability. So hopefully we can see that this thing of living by faith, this is our greatest challenge. This is our greatest challenge to the faith that we desire to have, the growth of our faith, the maturity of our faith. It's going to be there. And we have to overcome it. You continue to look at this topic. There are some great men who battle doubt. You remember John the Baptist? You remember when he was in prison? You remember him sending some of his disciples and had a question for Jesus? You remember what that question was? Are you the one? Or should we be looking for somebody else? This was John the Baptist. And it's amazing how gracious the Lord is to us because uh, Jesus sent back proofs and evidence of what he was doing. But you know what? It was up to John the Baptist to take that proof and evidence and to build his faith. As it's up to all, each one of us as well to take the proof and the evidence that our God continuously give to us and allow it to build our faith. This isn't going to happen overnight. This is a lifelong pursuit. So let us not get off base. Let us not be pushed around by the wind of our time. Let us be people of endurance, trust, faith, and seeking to grow. Allow that mustard seed to flourish into that amazing tree. And that we will be pursuing maturity in the Lord in which we serve. So any thoughts as we close out? Gabriel. The uh, thing I think of a lot about